Hello and welcome to Latika Takes, a podcast with me, Latika Burke. Hello, welcome to this week's episode. Today, I'm pleased to introduce you to John Hennessy Nyland. He's an American diplomat, former ambassador to Palau, a position to which he was appointed by the Trump administration. He's also served as a foreign policy advisor to the United States Marine Corps Forces Pacific in Hawaii. He's been posted to Fiji, Ireland, Pakistan and Australia, and directed the National Security Council for G20 and G7. Since his retirement, he's become Professor of Practice at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. John Hennessy Nyland, welcome. Thank you. It's always great to chat with you, Latika. John, you've just published this excellent piece on US power in the Pacific. It's called Making Our Rhetoric Real, US Diplomacy in the Pacific Islands. We're going to discuss a lot of that, and I'll include a link to it in the show notes. But I actually want to begin by asking a very basic question, which is when we're talking about the Pacific, what are we talking about and why, in your view, is it so strategic? And I'm actually going to caveat why I'm asking and beginning with this question, because I've just endured a week here in London watching and listening to the British press report about going to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Samoa like it was the moon. And it worries and troubles me greatly to hear some of the best journalists in the country here talk about what's part of the Commonwealth and a hugely strategic part of the world nonetheless in such a a foreign and unknown way. So if you can take it away by explaining exactly what we're talking about and just why it's so important. Great. And and it is a great question. You know, I think one way to think about the Pacific is think of it as the blue continent, right? It's a vast area that connects Asia with America and and with the rest of the world. Uh, It has always mattered. You just have to look at history. But you're right, Latika, we probably know more about the moon than we do about the Pacific. And I've served in the region for for decades. Some people have described it as flyover territory. You know, in America, we have this this view that only the coasts matter. You know, we have uh, the West Coast and the East Coast and something else in between, the great Midwest where I come from. So I get it. And I was in Fiji, served there as an American diplomat, and the acting prime minister once upon a time said, we'll just fly over, you know, we're dots on a map and on a lot of maps, you don't even see us, we're too small to be included. So a lot of people don't know a heck of a lot about the Pacific. We now describe it in US government terms as the Indo-Pacific, essentially from Hollywood to Bollywood. It's a vast area. So on the one hand, I think it's totally acceptable to, to consider it as one blue continent, but, but, and it's an important but, you know, it's made up of a lot of different places. Each of them are complex, even if they're small. And, and too often, and our leaders have just flown over them to important meetings somewhere else. The area really, truly does matter. And specifically, how has U.S. foreign policy treated the region over time? Well, you know, I've been <clears throat> perhaps an oddball in the U.S. Uh, foreign service. You know, I was fortunate enough to, to finish my career as an ambassador to the Republic of Palau, but I've also served in Fiji, I've served in Hawaii, uh, and also in Australia. So I have had a bit of experience uh, in in the Pacific, but it's not a typical career path. You know, it's not career enhancing, though I say it's career enriching. But I would probably describe it, and I'm not the first to do this, it's been a, uh, has been a lengthy period of benign neglect. You know, obviously, Uh, We were very, very engaged with our allies uh, in World War II in the Pacific, and and that legacy definitely matters. But understandably, the United States and others, uh, you know, have global interests. Um, You can just think of the world today and think about Ukraine or the Middle East. So I get it. It's understandable that there have been periods of of this neglect. Kirk Campbell, Deputy Secretary of State, has acknowledged that. Uh, as has Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. So I'm not the first to say that, but we do face a credibility gap in the region. And others have also noted, and and I've seen this firsthand, it's a contested area. Uh, We're in a competition, truly, for not only the hearts and minds uh, of the region, but economically, politically, militarily, strategically, uh, the Indo-Pacific and particularly the Pacific Islands really do matter. Um, They mattered in World War II. They'll matter again if contest turns to confrontation. 
but let's hope not in terms of conflict. Personally, I think the future of America will be made in the Pacific. And let's hope it's a peaceful one. Okay, that's a big call. And I'm going to come back to that comment in particular. But I just want to keep going with this journey that US foreign policy is on. Of course. So was the US, did it find itself in a competition before it realized the race had started? And if so, when was that penny dropping moment? You know, I, I did mention that I served in, in Australia. And I think Australia, Japan, the United States, even Taiwan have all stepped up, to use that term, in terms of our engagement uh, across the Pacific. But, you know, when I was in Australia... And, and we uh, should just say here, John, our, our paths, unfortunately, never crossed in Australia. No, uh, they didn't. Um, <laughs> we'll, it we'll get to... But, it would but, have it would have been great fun. But you know, in in the bubble in in Canberra, my great colleagues, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, would really really encourage us to do more. Specifically, and, do more what? Well, I'll get to that. Okay, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll try to be as specific as I can. But but the Australians sort of described our effort as simply we're losing less quickly. And think about that. <laughs> you know, the world isn't static. Uh, there's competition. And we have a pacing adversary, as we have described, the People's Republic of China. So there has been a wake-up call in Australia uh, in terms of PRC interference in its own internal affairs, also by extension in the near neighborhood, uh, in Melanesia and Polynesia, and also further north in the Western Pacific that I know well, in Micronesia. It's been very, very clear that we have legitimate, real concerns shared by the Pacific Islanders, I, I want to emphasize. But you know, to give you a specific example, I think the pandemic was a real wake-up call. Speaking about the strategic importance uh, of these small Pacific Island nations in the region, we all remember, right, having to rush to the supermarket to buy toilet paper. You know, we were concerned whether our cell phones uh, would continue to, to work. I, I would get... just like to state for the record, yes. I never once panic bought. Just, okay. I, I would just like to state that for the record. It's something I'm very proud of. All right, kudos to you. Kudos to you. Um, but you know, I, I've seen you on your on your phone, um, and I think <laughs> a lot. Be lost. Yes, you'd be lost without it. I would. Um, and people, are, you know, getting delays and getting anxious about when were they going to get their new iPhone or whatever it is. So that kind of made us realize, heck, you know, this isn't just flyover territory. You know, think about it. We talk about the freedom of seas, the freedom of the ocean. And we have that understanding, you know, it sounds a little antique, a little ancient, a little historic. But think of this, you know, freedom of seas do matter because of secure supply chains, right? And and we, we saw firsthand what the pandemic did to supply chains. And that's just what's floating on those large container ships crisscrossing the vast Pacific. But also think about what's underneath. Think about the fiber optic cables that link all of us so that you can go online and check out whatever you want. And so those small economies can link to the great vast global economy. Think about the disruption and the damage that could take place to your life, no matter where you are, if there is a contingency or a disruption or heaven forbid conflict in the Pacific Islands. You may think it's far away, but it will come home really quickly to you in terms of the disruption of your daily life if the Pacific doesn't remain Pacific. Why? Does China want to dominate the Pacific specifically? Well, you know how people say proximity matters? Geography does too. Uh, you know, I, I'm a professor now, right, in practice. Um, let me stress of practice uh, as a career diplomat uh, here at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M. <laughs> and we talked a lot about history. And I think probably some of the students are like, uh, you know, what does that matter? But just think about it. You know, we had an island hopping campaign in World War II, a different adversary then. But the first and second island chains are a real focus for any, any nation interested in preserving a rules-based international order. The challenge, though, is that we now have what has been described, I think, in Anthony Blinken in his most recent article on foreign affairs as a revisionist power, someone who wants to change what has really assured peace and prosperity for decades, not just in the Pacific, but globally. So we see the, the, the push and the contest and occasionally the rubbing up of a potential conflict in places like the South China Sea or the East or West Philippine Sea, if you want to describe it that way, in the Taiwan Straits. All right. That's the first island chain right next door to the Philippines and very close to Taiwan. If there's any contingency or, 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 or contest there lies the second island chain. That's exactly where Palau sits. 
It is strategic. And, you know, the concern is if there is conflict in the first island chain, we have to fight from somewhere. And that's going to be the second island chain, right? And, and that was the same in a different conflict back in World War II. It would be the same, no doubt, mm -hmm. um, if conflict arises again. Mm -hmm. But what we're trying to do by stepping up and engaging more fully in the Pacific is to ensure that that never happens again. And that's where we're stepping up across the board. You asked me for specifics, right? You know, generalities, meh, you know, words don't matter, action does, correct? Even as a diplomat, I get that. Um, but we've stepped up economically mm -hmm. uh, and, and in terms of assistance, uh, in terms of development and capacity building, as well as um, militarily. So we're using all the tools of statecraft and not just the United States. The great advantage that like-minded countries enjoy is that we have friends and we want to be the partner of choice. We don't want to force our partnership or use coercion or the malign or malicious behavior to compel a country to do something. We want to be, you know, the quality partner. Uh, and that's the same for Australia, Japan, so many other countries in the region. And that's our great advantage. And so I think we are doing better, but we still have a long way to go. I mean, picking up on that, we're already seeing many Pacific Island nations turn their back on the so-called partner of choice. Solomon Islands is a good example. I think another one is Nauru, which recently recut ties with Taiwan which is something, of course, Beijing wants and encourages many Pacific Island nations to do. So how much of an advantage is it really in a material way when you have significant defeats like that? I think we have to we have to parse that question a little bit, Latika. You know, whether a country recognizes Taiwan or the People's Republic of China is a sovereign decision. And heck, uh, most of the like-minded countries in the region I just described do recognize Beijing, not Taipei. The concern, though, is is that is that the start of a change in the direction of these islands, you know, foreign policy, and will that lead to some some, as you said, some distance and and uh, growing distrust of of the U.S. or Australia, and more of an embrace of the People's Republic of China, and therefore concerns about policing potential military bases and everything else that might come along with a deeper relationship between People's Republic of China and, and the Pacific Islands. That is one issue. And the, the choice of, of whether to recognize uh, Beijing or, or Taipei is a sovereign one. But the, the concern is this, and, and we'll use the example that I know best, Palau, right? And President of Palau, Serenga Whips Jr., has been very public about this. And by the way, they face a large election next week, not just in the United States. We face an important election in Palau on the same day in the Pacific. But Serenga Whips Jr. has been very public. He said that when he was running for, for president four years ago, Granted, there's no PRC ambassador in Palau. Palau recognizes Taiwan, one of the 12 countries in the world that do. But the, the, you know, over in FSM, the Chinese ambassador called him so often that Serenga Wip Jr. had to change phones, had to get a different mobile. But nonetheless, he still was being pestered by the PRC ambassador, who essentially used carrots and sticks. On the one hand, he said, look, if you get elected and you move Palau toward recognizing Beijing and not Taipei, you'll have the moon and the stars, whatever you want. But if you don't, you know, there, there might be difficulties. And lo and behold, Chinese tourists who used to go to Palau in, in large numbers vanished. Right. Even today, Palau is not one of the approved destinations for, for Chinese visitors. I see. And that's had an economic consequence. So, you know, the, 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 it's not so much the question of recognition. It's that the PRC is trying to force and compel countries to change policy and I think that is concerning. Let's focus on your time in Palau. So you're appointed yes. in 2020, which yes. makes you a Trump administration appointee, I believe. Yes, yes, correct. So, Though I'm a career foreign service yes. officer. Yes, we should. 35 years in, <laughs> in the business. Absolutely. And yes, you know, I try to be as, as, as um, nonpartisan. Yes, I was appoint, uh, nominated by, by President Trump, confirmed by the US Senate, but also I had the opportunity to serve in the White House in the first term of President Obama. Okay, right. So you're a true servant of the of the US Constitution, we could say. Hopefully. <laughs> when you're posted to Palau, do you get sent with a, here's a, a KPI list? What was the goal for you when you set up shop in Palau? What are your priorities? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. The first response is always for any ambassador, you know, looking after American people, right? First concern is the welfare and well-being 
uh, of your citizens. And that always was top line, first order of responsibility, not just for me, but uh, for any ambassador and any embassy globally. And I think that holds true for every country, not just uh, America. But specifically for Palau, you know, I boiled it down to what I called the three C's. You know, I'm a big believer, having worked with the U.S. Marine Corps in, in Hawaii as a foreign policy advisor, commander's intent, you know, really distilling what we're about so that everybody in the mission from top dog, you know, from, from the AMBO down to the third secretary and, and our local staff, which are so important. We all had to know what we're about to be effective, right? Particularly as our missions in the Pacific are so small, <laughs> we really have to be good at our game. So I boiled it down and I, and I had um, little cards, little like business cards printed up that everyone had in their wallet. And it was our mission, right? Statement, if you want to term it that way. I call it the bit three C's. One, China, okay? But not China, China, China. We had two other C's. But yes, the competition uh, with the People's Republic of China and our concern about their malicious and malign behavior. And it was it was evident that that was taking place in Palau. I just give one example about the offer to, to uh, President Swango Whips to change recognition and get money in exchange. The second C, though, was climate. And that might surprise you. Climate is a threat to Pacific Island countries. And I think as a partner and wanting to be the partner of choice, we have to help them with these types of challenges that for them are existential, really, really are significant. And let me explain, it also matters to the U.S. If an island is having problems with adverse weather, um, severe weather effects, uh, rising sea levels, rising temperature of the ocean, we want these countries to prosper, right? We want them to be peaceful. If the tourism based, you know, all of that could really wreck what is the most important part of their economy. So it matters to us to, to work on climate with these countries. Think about if typhoons come through, wreck a port, a wharf, destroy the navigation aids and the channels there, that matters to the fisher people. It also matters to us in terms of getting our Coast Guard there regularly or our Navy. So, you know, it matters and, it work, and it's important for both countries to focus on that second challenge, which is climate. And the third is capacity, what we call capacity building. You know, another term for it would be development, right? These are small places. Often they have capacity issues. Think of healthcare. Um, I mentioned the pandemic. Think of infrastructure in particular. I mentioned uh, fiber optic cables, you know, connecting these small economies to the World Wide Web and uh, everything that goes on in the global marketplace. Capacity, strengthening good governance, right? These countries are under threat from organized crime, largely from Chinese triad organizations. So beefing up the prosecutors staff, working and improving court systems, helping law enforcement. You know, that is important to Palau, but it also, you know, a stronger, good government, sure dem democracy uh, across the Pacific is in the U.S. and, and allied interests. So those were the, the big three C's that we focused on. I'll give you a small example of how we did it pragmatically, right? Climate. I was really proud that uh, we worked uh, with my government, the U.S. government, and, and a large number of other governments. So that Palau hosted the first ever Our Ocean Conference that was held in the Pacific and in an island. We had the Special Envoy for Climate, former Secretary of State John Kerry, come all the way to Palau. And as he said, you got to be a badass, right, if you're going to make that journey, because it's far. But we brought together hundreds of people, actually during the pandemic, nonetheless, we got it done. And we really moved the ball on climate issues as they relate to the ocean, right? And that was what matters for people in the Pacific. And we did our small part at the U.S. Embassy in Karor. We were the first green U.S. diplomatic installation anywhere in the world. We were producing so much solar energy that we were contributing power back to Palau's national grid rather than taking from it to run the U.S. Embassy. I mean, small scale, obviously, it's a small embassy. But we tried to work every level on the three C's, China, climate and capacity building. How difficult was that given former President Trump pulled the US out of the Paris Climate Accord? How did that go down in Palau and how, yeah, you know, how I, would that go down under a second administration? Yeah, I get it. You know, people question American credibility, not just on that point, um, and commitment to these issues. I always tried to explain it as to why it matters for Palau and for the United States. I gave the example of access, you know, working to, to strengthen Palau's resilience uh, on climate, working on ocean issues and the environment matters economically and also in terms of security uh, and the ability of the U.S. to operate in those areas 
to access Palau in the case of a, of a contingency. And that makes sense, I think, to our military commands and, and, and even to Washington. I stay out of the politics. I'm a diplomat, right? I try to focus on concrete ways we can demonstrate to Palau and other countries across the Pacific that we can be the partner of choice. I understand people would like us to sign up to UNCLOS when we do our freedom of navigation operations, the inconsistency that exists uh, at times in American foreign and security policy. But, you know, consistency isn't always a virtue. And I would push back and say that irrespective uh, uh, of the international agreements, if you actually look at what we're doing, I think we, we, we're, 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 we're demonstrating that we are trying to work with our partners on issues that matter to them as well as to us. On the China, was there mm. local resistance or resentment even about being caught in the crosshairs between these two superpowers who are battling it out and these tiny islands are just caught in the middle? What kind of military basing or capacity do you build on Palau and do the locals accept it? And if there is a conflict, are they happy for you to be operating out of there? All right. So we've reached the elephant in the room here, right? <laughs> Does American presence in the Pacific mean we're putting a target on the back of Pacific Islanders? I would say no for a lot of reasons. And let me explain a few of them. You know, the Pacific matters. Pacific Islanders get it. I think one part of the arrogance, you know, of Westerners is that, you know, sometimes it's along the lines of don't talk about the war, right? Um, <laughs> You know, they were there that, you know, they were they, they experienced the conflict in the Pacific. They definitely want to avoid it. We do, too. Right. And our view is the best way to ensure that that doesn't happen is to deter any likelihood of aggression. That's why we have a number of partnerships across the Pacific in the Western Pacific, the Northern Pacific, however you want to describe it, across Micronesia. We have three compacts of free association. Essentially, the agreements between three sovereign countries, Palau, Micronesia, Marshall Islands and the United States whereby we support them, we are responsible for their defense and security, we provide economic assistance, and we also enable their citizens to have education and work and benefit from that special relationship with the United States. In many ways, we regard them as part of the homeland. I'll tell you a funny story. I'm the US ambassador in Palau. I've served my whole career, 35 years as a diplomat. It was the very first time that one of the largest agencies I dealt with in Palau, a sovereign independent country, was the U.S. Department of Interior. Crazy, right? In a way. But so much of our assistance is economic, whereas people focus on the military. But getting back to your point, the Pacific Islanders understand the threat from malign and malicious activity. They see PRC research vessels entering their economic zones without any notification, without any sharing of the research. And interestingly enough, hovering over nodes of fiber optic cables or other areas of interest. They see illegal, unreported, unregistered fishing, the Chinese fishing fleets coming in and sucking up their fish and their sea cucumbers, polluting their waters, all right? They understand the damage that could cause to their environment, which is also an economic issue because it's the pristine Pacific, right? And if it's not kept that way, people won't come. And Palau is certainly a tourist destination, world's best scuba diving in the world. Well, I'm a scuba diver, so I should put that on my list. You definitely have to put it on your bucket list. Seriously, I know I'm biased, having served there, but you don't have to ask me, ask any of your friends who dive. It is the world's best. I will. But, it, you know, so they get that, right? They understand that it's not us pushing them onto a target. They already are potentially a target and have been before, right? And I think they see the benefit of aligning themselves with people who share their views, share their interests. Personal story. In Palau, small place, 18,000 people, similar across many of the small Pacific islands. A large number, though, uh, from the Pacific islands have served in the U.S. military. Interesting fact, or factoid is so small, but nonetheless important. On a per capita basis, more people from Palau and the Pacific islands have served in the U.S. military than from any of the 50 United States. Wow. So you can't come across a family in Palau that doesn't have some relationship with the U.S. military. An uncle, a brother. And also positions of leadership, a chief, politician, folks working uh, in the economy. Many of them have real connections, personal connections to the U.S. and the U.S. military. Many of them have studied uh, in the United States or worked for a period of time in the United States. Many of them have relatives across the United States. 
And, and that's, you know, I think important that it's not that we're pushing. I think there's a pull too to have a closer relationship with us. And so I don't say it's a target at all. I see us taking our responsibility seriously to, for the defense and security of the Pacific by helping deter the potential of any, any any conflict. But it's a struggle. There's pressure being put on these small Pacific Island countries by the People's Republic of China, and we try to push back against that daily in Palau and elsewhere. So I want to give you a small example. I was in Tonga earlier this year, and this right. is one of the Pacific Islands that the United States puts out a press release saying, we're beefing up our presence in the Pacific. Wow, look at us, we're back. And in reality, that post is a retiring diplomat in a rented office space across from what is a massive Chinese embassy that has been there forever. It has huge traction in the Tongan society, obviously. So it's one thing to say that the United States is beefing up its presence, but what's the quality of that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fair question, Otika. You know, I've been public. I mean, and this is this is one of your criticisms yes, in the paper, public. I think, where you um, talk you about... Know, I, I, I'm a big believer in American diplomacy. Obviously, I spent my entire life as a practitioner of, of American diplomacy, particularly in the Pacific. And so when I, when I criticize the State Department, you know, I do it with the best intentions, which is to acknowledge that, as others have done, and I mentioned just earlier, um, we have a credibility gap to start with because of benign neglect in the Pacific. So... As the Australians have so kindly put it, you know, we're losing less quickly maybe with our step up, but we still have a long way to go to catch up. And and, and I, I experienced that, of course, uh, in the Pacific and in, in my, my recent article in the Foreign Service Journal that you referenced, you know, it's really a call to serve um, that we need our very best in, in the Pacific. And we actually, I think, need to be a little bit more honest that we have a long way to go. I, I think it is important that we're opening new posts, you know, across the region. You mentioned Tonga, the number of others that are opening uh, or have opened. But also, I think we have to be honest, particularly with our Pacific Island friends, that the opening of a post is just the beginning. These are not full service posts, as you correctly point out. You know, the staff initially of TDY, temporary duty folk, uh, they're operating out of storefronts. Um, they don't have full consular services. They don't have the full suite, you know, uh, uh, of the interagency platform that can provide real partnership. Val, you know, valuable quality partnership with the Pacific Islands. I've said that compound our credibility gap. We really have a problem if we overpromise and underdeliver, because that provides an opening for others to come around and say, "Hey, you see, the Americans are all talk." You know, as we say in Texas, "All hat, no cattle." And you know, I don't know if we need to compete dollar for dollar, but we do have to focus on quality versus quantity. We don't and shouldn't have vast missions of hundreds of diplomats in Nukalofa. Begs the question of what are all those Chinese diplomats doing, right, in parentheses. But we do have to have an appropriate sized mission with the ability to truly partner. And it's not all about money. I think in the, in the U.S. Congress, you will find very strong bipartisan support for America stepping up in the Pacific. I think that will continue. Regardless of who wins. Yeah, this is this is one of the few things that unites America, um, isn't it? it, it <laughs> yes, well put. Um, but even with the election coming up, whoever wins the uh, and is our next president, I'm quite confident that that there will continue to be by strong bipartisan support, and that funding is starting to flow. I get it. American government is a bureaucracy; it takes time. But but we do we do risk you know uh, over promising and, and under delivering if we don't improve the follow up. And that's always the hardest part, you know, as a professional bureaucrat, if you don't want to call me a diplomat, mm -hmm. I know that the hardest challenge I faced as the chief of mission was, okay, we got the announcement, we got the agreement, we make the announcement, now we have to deliver. And, and that, if there's delay or any, or any, you know, problem in the delivery of that promise, then we do have a problem. But the follow-up is tough. Um, we don't have a command economy. I can't force American business to do anything. I can encourage them. Likewise, I can use the convening power as an ambassador to really corral the interagency and, and get us all on the same page. But you have to push. It's a constant work of an embassy, not just to work on the relationship with your host country. You got to continue to push uh, your interagency colleagues. And, and as I said, it's not all about money. It's not all about congressional funding. I, I tend to think there's an imbalance still in how we staff our posts across the Indo-Pacific. Sometimes I think 
I've used this expression, and, and I think it is, remains true today. Some of our motor pools in our larger embassies in Asia have more people than our embassies do in small Pacific countries. And that, you know, we got to get that right. And that's on us. That's on the State Department and the U.S. government to, to do that. Well, you've mentioned the second elephant in the room. And now that you're not in the State Department anymore, I'm hoping you might answer this one a little more. I hope I'm still diplomatic, though. <laughs> well, yeah, but I've, I've, I've subsequently learned that being a diplomat is actually not about being di- di- a diplomatic person necessarily. Uh, it's about getting outcomes, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean you're, 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 you know, the, yes, a number of politicians, I'm not a politician, have said that diplomats are not always nice. And, and I think that's fair. Um, but go ahead, ask your question. Okay. But you're, you're very diplomatic as well, John. I'll certainly Thank give you, you that. So I think there's a perception amongst some of even the United States' closest friends that the election is mm. a bit of a question of stability. And we have seen a lot of speculation. We've seen examples in the former Trump administration of where he may be willing to sell out what are your allies, your partners, your friends. Maybe it begins with Ukraine. Maybe even it includes Taiwan. What is the Pacific to do if it's President Trump on January 6th? You know, I, 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 I get this question a lot, right? And it's not the first time people have wondered about America's role and its commitment to being engaged globally. I mentioned history, right? I love history. I have a bunch of books in my office and at home. Um, let's be, let's be honest, right? America has always had these twin poles, engaged internationally or being, you know, focusing on the homeland and 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 being isolationist, right? We've always navigated between those two poles. And if you want the way you want to describe it, maybe there's a pendulum, right? We swing violently at times from one to the other for every four years because we're a democracy. You know what? As a professional diplomat. 35 years of experience. Trust me, I do think words matter as a diplomat, but action is is even more important. And I don't know if our national interest changes that dramatically. Social and sensitive issues domestically, yes, there's a, there's a wide divergence between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party currently. What I'm most concerned about is the fact that perhaps we've lost the ability, speaking as a diplomat, to disagree agreeably right? Uh, Civil discourse is difficult right now. But I do believe in that old expression that politics ended at the shoreline and we have a bipartisan approach overseas. That's not completely true, obviously. But our national interests, e.g. the importance of the Pacific to the United States and to our partners, that will remain. The challenge from the PRC in that region will remain, irrespective of who wins the election. So I would counsel, I I would suggest that there may not be as dramatic a change as some may imagine. You know, I served during the first Trump administration, right? I was in meetings when tweets came out from the president about issues we were talking about in the very meeting, right? So it does mean that American diplomacy has to be agile and flexible, you know, understanding of political context back home. But that's, that's always the case. So I would suggest that on key issues, such as our commitment to the Pacific, the challenge of the PRC globally, the importance of allies and partners, I think you'll see less change than you might you might predict. And if you really look at the first term of President Trump, you know, there really wasn't that dramatic a change in the overall orientation of American foreign policy. There were a lot of tweets, a lot of commentary stylistically, but substantively, you know, I think there was significant continuity too. Yeah. So I've just reached behind me and pulled off my bookshelf. I can see the worry in your face, perhaps some amusement. I've pulled off John Bolton's book. Now, yes. John Bolton, of course, was- In the room or something, so, right? Yeah, the room where it happened. He was yes. He was one of Trump's many, many national security can I advisors. Can I let you know something Go that on. you may not know? Go on. Tell me. My very first job as a diplomat, not my first assignment, because American diplomats always get sent overseas first, but my very first job back at the State Department, I was the staff aide to John Bolton. What? Really? I was. Okay, so in the in the um the beef up between When he was assistant secretary of state for international organizations. So I think during the period of the Gulf War one. Well, you, I was you look a lot a lot younger than that experience would attest, John. But anyway, I, 
Hey, you, I was appointed as a diplomat by President Reagan. Oh, really? All right. Okay. Yeah, so I'm old. Okay, fine. That means you're wise and experienced and you can tell me mm. the truth as you see it. Now, I, 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 I want to go to this passage about what he says about when Trump is asked about Taiwan. And he Trump ba mm, basically ahead. throws Taiwan under a bus, doesn't he? I'm just looking up the index to try and find this page properly. But as I, oh, you're getting your copy. Oh, this is brilliant. Wow, we could have a book club together. See, I, I actually have my oh, copy. Oh, you've got the post-it notes. Of paper with post notes okay, on can, the very Can you find out where which page, which Taiwan it is, where he talks about Trump throwing him under the bus, uh, Taiwan under the bus, basically? It's something about a Sharpie pen, remember? Yeah, uh, yeah, but you know, I, as I said, I was a staff aide to John Bolton, so I appreciate. Oh yes, hang on, I've got okay, it. Okay, what page it. number? Although it. Although it came in several variations, one of Trump's favorite comparisons was to point to the tip of one of his Sharpies and say, this is Taiwan, then point to the Resolute Desk and say, this is China. So much for American commitments and obligations to another Democratic ally. So I think there, John Bolton now, John Bolton and Donald Trump, of course, have famously and very publicly fallen out. Yes, I think that's important to remember. It is important to remember. But you work, now you've told me, you worked for John Bolton. I mean, do we trust his account here? I think we definitely agree that they they have fallen out. Um, you're being you're being a diplomat. Actually, you're being more of a politician with that answer. Oh, John. I'm being a diplomat. <laughs> um, you know, there's a reason why John Bolton wrote the book, right? And, and John Bolton, in his own way, is as theatrical as President Trump, right? You know, John Bolton kept a grenade on his desk. What? A inert a grenade, not a live grenade. Don't get worried. Why? But, you know. He, 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 I don't think he would be appalled if someone described him as a grenade thrower, right? <laughs> okay, fine. So, um, you know, he, he writes a lot and, and he has a strong uh, opinion on, on many issues, you know, and I don't always agree with all of them. I will tell you this, though, about him. He is one of the hardest working people that I ever saw at the State Department. You can disagree 100% with perhaps what he's what he's arguing for, but but you know sometimes just showing up and and working hard is you know of, of importance. I give him full credit for that. And you know what? Also, just a, just a, a backstory on John Bolton, what people don't fully appreciate. People see him as sort of the wants to kind of destroy the UN system, and and he's he doesn't think it's you know working well, and he doesn't think it's working well. But nonetheless, we passed I think a handful of UN resolutions, right, uh, during the first Gulf conflict. We organized the Coalition of International Partners, and we were very successful in that effort. And, and John Bolton played a large role in that, despite his concerns and misgivings about some of the ineptitude you find in the United Nations. And by the way, I'm a big believer in the UN, too. I served as a UN peacekeeper, a war crimes investigator in the Balkans and Rwanda. So I get the importance. But I also have seen, like John Bolton, some of its real problems uh, you know, and weaknesses in that. So. You know, I do think there's a lot of issues that people would agree with John Bolton, and there are many others where people go, no. On Taiwan, you know, it's a tough call, right? There are probably lots of Americans, not just John Bolton or President Trump, who have concerns about, you know, what would we, what could we do? Not what would we do, but what could we actually practically do if there was conflict over Taiwan? I have said, and I'll repeat it here, you know, the policy of strategic ambiguity has run its course, I think. Oh, interesting. The idea that, so you agree with this Biden coming out and saying, we're definitely going to defend Taiwan if you attack? Well, you know, the interesting thing about Biden's few comments that were then walked back by the National Security Council, causing a lot of confusion, you know, maybe that was all deliberate, you know, to keep the Chinese he said, guessing. He said it four times. I don't think yes. it was an accident. As, you know, keep the, keep, keep, keep the, the PRC guessing yeah. uh, is what the U.S. would do. All part of strategic ambiguity. But, you know, today is not the same place as you know, and Taiwan is not the same place. And, and the PRC's, you know, increasing aggression against Taiwan is not the same as it was 10, 20, 30 years ago when strategic ambiguity, you know, I think was effective. I argue we need greater strategic clarity. Which means? I'm of the view that we should tell the world any conflict over Taiwan would engage the United States. I would retain some- And Australia in that? I, I would hope our allies and partners would assist. And my view is we need greater strategic clarity about pointing out that that engages American interests and we will respond. I would like to retain some strategic amb ambiguity about how exactly we would do that, which partners might participate, how we would achieve that. And I think that's up for our, our military commanders to, to plan for. 
But, you know, just in the last few weeks, we've seen a huge military exercise by the PRC, essentially to practice either a maritime quarantine or blockade and potential future invasion of Taiwan. You know, that that's that should be pushed back against. That's, that's not appropriate behavior. They were incensed by comments made by the new president of Taiwan. Well, you know what? Taiwan's a democracy. People can say what they want. And therefore, I do think we need to be clearer about policy toward Taiwan, but maintain the flexibility as to how exactly we would respond as increasing, you know, the, the, the deterrent effect so that hopefully we, 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 we prevent any type of conflict. What any U.S. administration will do, be it President Trump or President Harris, I don't know. Um, I would hope, and actually in my heart, though I know hope is not a strategy, it's a town in Arkansas, um, I believe that we would stand up and, and defend our friends and, and partners and democracy, and that, that includes Taiwan. Yeah, right. Really interesting, because we, of course, met in Taiwan earlier this year. You did. And you made history, I think, becoming one of the first U ambassadors to meet then I did. the president. Yeah. I ruffled some feathers. Um, as you said, diplomats are always nice, not nice guys. But I, I went in, in, in 21, the first ambassador to visit since the adoption of the One China policy by the United States. And I, I, I threaded the needle by not going in my own right, but by accompanying the president of Palau, which is one of the 12 countries that recognizes uh, Taiwan. And I imagine that was carefully crafted by the State Department, right? I mean, anything you do in relation to Taiwan is no accident. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about, uh, you know, what went on and, uh, within the Department of State or, or with the NSC, but I, I will say that it was a sort of a day-to-day -day decision. You know, up until the very last moment, it wasn't completely certain that I would go. But timing matters. And, uh, you know, I think it was felt that it was important to demonstrate support for the relationship between Palau and Taiwan, to acknowledge how much work Taiwan was doing in Palau and the region to help countries respond, Pacific Island countries respond to the pandemic. And, you know, I think also certainly to signal that we appreciate Palau's uh, and Taiwan's relationship. And, and a way to, to demonstrate that uh, was to take part in that visit. Because on the ground in Palau, we were doing a lot together with Palau, with Taiwan and, and other countries, India, Japan, Australia, to really try to, to keep Palau safe from the pandemic. So that was a lot, some of the factors, no doubt, that went into, into, into the visit. Really interesting. Okay, this is my final question. I mean, I could talk to you forever, John, but as far as you see it, the regional architecture that's in place, mm. we've got AUKUS, we've got Quad, we've got individual treaty alliances. What do you see playing out in any Taiwan contingency. I mean, for example, AUKUS is meant to be all about preserving South China Sea, but those subs are probably going to come on a bit too late for any conflict as we currently calculate it, right? Well, well, let's, let's you know, the best diplomatic tool is to parse out your question, right? There's a lot in that question. There is a lot, you. I know. Um, let's just first so, start So with you can our... take whichever bit you like, really. I, and no doubt I will, right? You know that. <laughs> Um, but let's just first take the architecture. Um, you know, we talked about how on the one hand, the uh, Indo-Pacific is seen as one, you know, flyover area in a very large world and, and, and people don't necessarily know too much about it. And that's true. Uh, on the other hand, though, you know, the Indo-Pacific is very complicated. There's a lot of regional architecture. You've mentioned AUKUS, which is even bigger than just the region involving um, the United Kingdom, the United States and others, potentially. You mentioned, I think you mentioned the Quad. Uh, in Australia, US and Japan. But then there's also regional architecture, right? We talked about the Compact of Free Associations for the three countries in Micronesia that have a special relationship uh, with the United States. We could talk about New Caledonia and French Polynesia that are you know, dependent territories of France. There are a number of in, uh, arrangements between New Zealand, Australia and the French on humanitarian assistance in Polynesia. And the, pre the preeminent political um, architectural organization for Pacific Islands is the Pacific Island Forum. PIF, yes. And we saw just the PIF. And, and we just saw a little while ago some of the tension uh, in the PIF when a number of countries, principally from Micronesia, but not exclusively, threatened to pull out. Yeah. Because they felt, and for, for a lot of reasons, that, that the PIF was focused on not Micronesia. That was, you know, regarded maybe by the PIF as America's patch, right? 
Um, and and the, the islands in the north were sort of saying, well, hey, what about us, right? Uh, we're Pacific too. We're part of the Pacific too. There's also issues about how to treat Taiwan, you know, and its relationship with the PIF. And, and I think there was also concerns at the time about the leadership, some concerns about the, the, the head of the PIF, but also there wasn't fair play in, in terms of how the next leader was selected, you know, in, in the best way, tradition of the Pacific and, and the Tanoa. It was meant to be rotational and by consensus, and it was Micronesia's turn. Fortunately, with a lot of diplomacy, it was worked out. And the PIF is is a family once again. But I do think there 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 can be more focus by the PIF uh, on cooperating with important partners. You know, sometimes I do feel when I was in Fiji, and even more recently when I was in Palau, that the PIF's relationship with the United States is strained, and I don't think that's appropriate. We're an important partner. Uh, of the Pacific. And I think that's for political reasons. We need to find a way to improve that. And I think the ball is really in PIF's court to do that. You know, Australia has been heavily engaged in the Pacific Island Forum. There's been some criticism, you know, of, of Australian diplomacy toward, toward the PIF, you know, the big brother in the room. But, uh, you know, I think the PIF is an important institution, but it has to, I think it has to get its act together too. And I think if you talk to Pacific Island leaders, they would acknowledge that. So these structures exist, they're not all very strong, and they overlap. And trying to, to, to knit all that together, you know, is, is a challenge, particularly when you have the People's Republic of China trying to undermine much of that architecture. You know, that's what I would say about, about Pacific Islands and, and Pacific Ocean architecture. Also, to be frank, at times, I think it's entirely appropriate uh, that, you know, we can disagree with, with, with the PIF. At times, you know, countries have to act unilaterally. I know, and that's a terrible word for some people. So consensus is important, and, and it's a great principle, but it doesn't always work, you know, and, and sometimes countries have to make a captain's call, a tough call, and, and I think that should be understood, and, and, and we continue to work uh, on issues that are difficult. So I, you know, I, I recognize I live in a glass house, right? So I try not to throw stones uh, as a diplomat. But, you know, work needs to be done to, to strengthen the architecture, no doubt. But it's not just on the part of the partners with the uh, with Pacific Islands. You know, I think the institutions in the Pacific Islands need to strengthen um, themselves as well. We could do, almost do another episode on that. I think, John, there's a lot of dynamics at play in the Pacific. Okay, well, we've reached that part of the podcast. You may ask me anything. It's entirely voluntary. You don't have to. I'll ask you the same question. Why are you interested in the Pacific? Why am I? Well, I mean, I'm shocked how few people in Europe are interested in the Pacific. I think it's the strategic frontier of everything we face over the next 50 years. So if you're not interested in the Pacific, you're not understanding where the, the challenges lie. And I think it's a very complex and difficult challenge for us to balance how to meet the needs of countries that may also not be above taking advantage of the huge competition that's underway. And Western democracies and governments have different expectations about how they spend development money. So I think it's a, a creative challenge for all of us really to think about how we can keep these countries on our side. And if you want to look at a binary term, so I'm intrigued from it from that point of view, but Mostly, I think it's it's just so important. And coming back to where we started, I mean, I was really, really honestly shocked to hear the British media talking about going to Samoa like it was Jupiter. I mean, uh, this is the Commonwealth that they are supposed to be upholding. This is their former colony. This is their 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 precious Commonwealth, and they seem to have no idea who is in their Commonwealth, what those places look like and how they feel about the world. And we've got a very big looming challenge coming up where some of those states could be vitally important to this. So that's my interest in the Pacific for sure. You, you know, you should be a diplomat. And, and, and <laughs> I can imagine as well, it can too... be pretty tough behind closed doors. So uh, <laughs> I, think I think I'm way too not diplomatic to be a diplomat. <laughs> And on that note, we'll say thank you so much for joining me, John. You've been a fascinating guest and I hope to have you on again thank soon. Thank you. And it's always great to chat with you. Cheers. You've been listening to Latika Takes with me, Latika Burke. You can find my work at latikambirk.com and this podcast where you find all your podcasts. See you next time.